Hi and welcome to this presentation on learning edit joint time frequency channel estimation for 5G NR. I'm Nitin Myers from TU Delft and today I'm going to be talking about this work with Yukjun Kwon, Yakong Ding and Kibong Song from Samsung San Diego. Let's start with some overview of this presentation first. I'll first begin by giving some quick introduction on the concept of resource grid and demodulation reference signals in 5GNR. Then I'm going to discuss how DMR signals can be useful for channel estimation. In the same context, I'm going to be talking about prior work based on signal processing and machine learning based solutions. Finally, I'm going to explain our proposed work on joint time frequency channel estimation for 5GNR. Information in 5GNR is sent over time frequency resources. Along the frequency axis, it's sent over different subcarriers that span a given bandwidth, and along the time axis, it's sent across different slots. A group of 12 successive subcarriers that share the same precoding is called as a resource block, commonly called RB. Each RB in 5GNR comprises a collection of resource elements. Every little box shown over here is a resource element commonly called RE. In 5GNR, there are exactly 168 REs within an RB that spans one slot. Now when information is sent over some of the REs, how does the receiver actually decode this information? It does so by following a sequence of operations. Channel estimation is a very important step in the modem operation because information about the estimated channel is used for equalization, interference whitening, and finally symbol detection. Now, how does the receiver actually estimate this channel in a downlink scenario? To understand this, let's take a look at the concept of resource block in more detail. Here is a resource block that comprises three different kinds of resource elements. The first kind of resource elements is called the control REs that are sent over the first two OFDM symbols in this configuration. The remaining two kinds of REs are the PDSCH REs, which is physical downlink shared channel REs that contain data and DMRS REs, which is demodulation reference signal REs that contain pilots. Now, when pilots are sent over DMRS REs, the receiver can first estimate the channel at the DMRS REs and using this information, it can interpolate or use some kind of algorithm to estimate the channel at the PDSCH REs. Once we have information about the channel estimates at the PDSCH REs, symbol detection becomes a straightforward problem. So the main challenge, which is going to be the focus of this work is on how to estimate the channel over PDSCH as well as DMRS REs using just the channel estimates at the DMRS REs. This and prior work has looked at three different directions. The first direction is based on linear or spline interpolation. And the second direction is based on LMMSC interpolation, wherein the estimator is linear and it exploits the second order channel statistics such as frequency domain correlation and the time domain correlation. And finally, there's been some interesting work on black box machine learning techniques that just run some kind of a regression algorithm, taking in channel estimates at DMRS REs as the input and giving out channel estimates over an entire RB. In this work, we propose a new technique that has all the advantages of LMMSE based interpolation as well as machine learning based methods. So before I get into the details of our algorithm, I'll first give you a quick overview of LMMSE interpolation, which exploits second order online channel statistics. In this technique, we first make the assumption that the channel follows wide sense stationary uncorrelated scattering. Under this assumption, Interpolation can be done in two stages. In the first stage, frequency domain interpolation is done. And in the second stage, time domain interpolation is done. Okay. So let me explain how FD interpolation is performed. So let's say channel estimates at the DMRS REs at symbol location one 
are collected in a vector r1. In FD interpolation, we construct this vector h1 hat that simply a multiplication of the interpolation matrix PFT with r1. Okay. Similarly, you can construct h2 hat. After this stage, time domain interpolation can be done by exploiting the correlation in the channel coefficients across the time dimension. At the end of these two stages, we end up with the channel estimates over an entire RB, which is collected in this matrix H hat interpolate. Okay. Now the first question is, how can the receiver estimate the matrix F PFD and PTD, which are basically interpolation matrices? One way to estimate these matrices is to use wideband tracking reference signals called TRS. And there's been some interesting work in references one and two on how to estimate the power delay profile and the Doppler spread from TRS signals. Note that TRS signals in NR are transmitted periodically. Okay. So with these spectral profiles, PDP and the Doppler spectrum, one can obtain frequency domain channel correlation as well as the time domain channel correlation by simply inverting the Fourier transform. And once we have these correlation values, it's very easy to construct the linear interpolation matrices PFD and PTD. Okay. While LMMSC interpolation based channel estimation techniques exploit online channel statistics that comes in the form of TRS, they have one limitation wherein the estimator is constrained to be linear in nature. One way to overcome this limitation is to simply cascade the LMMSE interpolation procedure with a neural network based refinement technique. Okay. So in this case, you notice that H hat interpolated, which comes after LMMSE interpolation goes into the neural network and it gets further refined. So the first question is how do we even train this neural network? So to train it, we first need to establish a database that contains a collection of H hat interpolated and the corresponding ideal channels over the RBs. Now these ideal channels are typically derived from a channel simulator. Okay. Now one important comment about this approach is that the complexity of this technique is large. And why do we care about this complexity? It's because this technique of refinement must be applied at each and every RB and each and every slot. Okay, so imagine a 15 kilohertz system spanning about 20 megahertz of bandwidth. There are about 100 RBs and we got to apply neural network based refinement 100 times in every one millisecond, which is the slot duration. Okay, therefore, it's very important to reduce the complexity of this neural network based refinement. Okay. Now, one way to reduce the complexity is to use a smaller neural network sandwiched between the FD interpolation and the TD interpolation blocks. Okay. So how do we train this neural network? So one way to train it could be by minimizing the MSC loss between the network output and the ideal channel subsampled exactly at the DMRS symbol locations. And why is it a reasonable objective? It's because in an ideal setting, H hat FDI is the subsample version of the ideal channel exactly at the DMRS symbol locations. Okay. So by minimizing the MSC loss between the network output and the subsample version of the ideal channel, we hope that the network converges to reasonable weights. Now this approach has relatively low complexity when compared to the approach on the left. However, the key challenge with this approach is that it doesn't minimize the MSC loss at all the PDS HREs it and minimizing the MSC loss at those REs is extremely important because ultimately the block error rate depends on the channel quality at the PDS HREs. To overcome the limitation with this approach, we propose a new technique wherein we train the MLP network in a different way. Okay. So instead of minimizing the MSC loss exactly at the DMRS locations, we minimize the MSC loss over an entire RB. And we do that by introducing this concept of a super network. A super network basically encompasses the MLP network and the TDM interpolation block. Okay. To understand the contents within the super network, 
we could simply replace this 3D interpolation block by a linear layer that essentially performs time domain interpolation. Okay, the weights of this linear layer are just PTD transpose. Okay, these are the linear interpolation weights obtained by exploiting the time domain channel correlation. Okay. So the question is, how do we train the super network? One important thing to note here is that the final layer of the super network, which is drawn from the TD interpolation block is non-trainable. Okay. So only the MLP layer over here is trainable. And the loss function that we use to train the super network is the MSE loss, where the MSE is defined between the channel estimate over the entire RB which is the output of the super network and the ideal channel. Okay. So the training samples in this context include the frequency domain interpolated channels, which is the input to the super network and the weights of the final layer, which is drawn from the TD interpolation block and the ideal channel. Okay. Now, one interesting thing to note here is that back propagation is performed through this TD interpolation layer. Okay. So that makes it very challenging from an implementation perspective, but it's but important it, to note that our procedure has exactly the same complexity as the previous procedure. It's because the architecture of this neural network remains the same. It's just that the training loss is defined differently in our method. So, so now let me explain how we initialize the MLP network within the super network and also discuss the bound on the training loss in our procedure. We simply load the weights from the previous training procedure into the super network. And we also showed in our paper that the training loss with the proposed method is upper bounded by the quantity shown over here. Now this quantity depends on the training loss when learning exactly at the DMRS locations, which is L learn DMRS and also the error due to the time domain LMMSE interpolation block. So now let's take a look at how our algorithms perform from a simulations perspective. We consider a system in FR1, so frequency range 1, where the carrier frequency is 3 GHz. We use a bandwidth of 20 MHz that corresponds to about 100 RBs. And it's a 2 by 2 MIMO system with 15 kHz subcarrier spacing. Okay. The DMRS configuration is exactly the same as what I've been showing throughout this presentation. It's a front loaded DMRS configuration with two DMRS OFDM symbols. Okay. TRS is sent periodically every 20 milliseconds and using this TRS, the Doppler spread and the power delay profile are estimated. Okay. For training, we use a data set containing EPFI, EVA30 and ETU70 channels here. Phi in EPFI denotes the Doppler spread for extended pedestrian A type of channels. Okay. So here is the configuration of the neural networks that we've used. We've used ALO activation for all the methods. And, and as you can notice from the figure on the right, our approach shown over here by these pink dash dot. lines performs better than conventional techniques based on classical linear interpolation or learning based methods that simply concatenate uh, linear interpolation techniques with a neural network. And here is the performance for EVA 30 channels and ETU 70 channels. We use a different MCS level. So it was 25 for EVA 30 evaluation and 16 for ETU 70 evaluation. So in both cases, you can notice that our method performs much better than the legacy linear frequency time interpolation technique. Okay. So let's take a look at a summary of today's presentation. I started off by making a distinction between learning based and LMMSE interpolation based channel estimation methods. In the proposed approach, the neural network is inserted between two LMMSE interpolation blocks corresponding to the frequency domain and the time domain. The training in our approach is very special when compared to conventional neural network training techniques. This is because back propagation is performed through a layer whose weights change with the training sample. And finally, we showed using simulations that the proposed approach performs much better than conventional techniques as it exploits online channel statistics and also has the advantages of data-driven learning. Thank you for watching and please let me know if you have any questions.